reason that I, I get to be here is it's kind of a fun story. We, years ago, I think it was like six or seven years ago, we were I was speaking on some other topic. And we were saying, you know, this is a drag. We, we come here and we put in all of this time and we don't get any ethics credit. And boy, we all need ethics credit, right? So uh, I was sitting around with the, with the folks that put this together and said, well, let's come up with something. So I came up with something um, with some other folks. And now I've been doing it every year since. And I've even been invited to give this presentation to the, to the New York bar. Um, and they've been flown here and given it to the, the wonderful bar location you know, in midtown Manhattan. You folks are going to want to sit close to other folks because we're going to have group discussions. So that's what, that was what started the whole thing. So let me give you the general premise of, of what we're going to be talking about and how we're going to talk about it. So how many folks here, well, I guess we're being recorded, so we shouldn't raise our hands on this. Um, so just think back in your mind and think of how many uh, ethics CLEs you folks have that sat through. And I mean, it's like going to the dentist. It's like, boy, the last thing I want to do is hear um, all of these uh, people who have the ability to take away my bar license telling me everything that I might do wrong and how they might take away my bar card. I mean, it's just not a fun time. Um, although we need to know this stuff, and we certainly need the credit. And so we, we come and we listen, and we're glad that we're out of there. And then at the end of the year, or three-year cycle, or whatever we have, you know, we, we look and we scramble and we're looking for that extra hour of ethics CLE. So um, that's, that's how I got to be here. Now, um, in terms of my background, I've been, uh, people know me for being uh, general counsel for Best Friends Animal Society, which I did for about a half a decade. I was also at Farm Sanctuary for several years as their general counsel, um, as uh, well as their um, executive director for a short time when we were in between executive directors. Since then, I practice. Uh, nonprofit law in Seattle with my wife, wife Laura Allen, and we have a nonprofit uh, animal law coalition, yes. which is a collection of uh, articles and resources that people all over the country use. Um, on a part time basis, I teach one class at uh, Lewis and Clark in nonprofit animal law. But for lots of years now, I've been giving, giving these presentations. So here's the format we're going to be talking about that typical or not so typical. Uh, Animal, not an animal rights lawyer, but uh, folks just like probably everybody in this room who volunteer for uh, animal nonprofits. Maybe I need a little more. Yeah, volunteer for animal nonprofits. And because you're a lawyer, you're out there, you know, doing all kinds of fun things for the organization, and you're trying to help the animals, and you do help the animals. But what we often forget is, you know, who are our clients in these situations? I mean. Has, I will ask for a raise of hands because I don't expect them any. Has anybody ever represented an animal? Has any of the lawyers in this room ever said, my client is, is Jim the dog? Yeah, the answer is no. I mean, unless you're Steve Wise, you don't represent animals. You know, I mean, we, we represent clients. We represent people. We represent organizations. And then we, we hook in with them so that we can do good works to help the animals. And we are always thinking about helping the animals but they're not our clients. And of course, you know, these, this big, thick set of rules here that, you know, can, if you don't follow, can cost you your bar card, um, they're all dealing with your relationships with your client. So what we're going to do is go through a hypothetical situation. I create a new one each time. Um, they're fun. It's, it's a romp of a kind of a, a presentation where these people, one person out trying to help the animals does about every conceivable thing that you could do wrong. Um, now, I've seen somebody do every one of these things, not all in one place, and certainly not as flamboyantly as our lawyer friend Billy you know, will be doing as you see. Um, the format is this. I'm going to uh, go through three segments, and we're going to break in between, talk amongst yourselves, because there's lots of learning that happens that way, and then we'll discuss the, the individual uh, rules of professional responsibility that, that come out. Now, it probably would be helpful, and I haven't done this before, but it, it dawned on me that I should probably take um, the highest view to start and to say, remind people what the rules of professional responsibility are. So somebody, what, what's the ABA rules of professional responsibility in one or two sentences? That's what we're going to be talking about, is the model rules. Someone? Somebody, or we're going to stand here a long time. Yeah, go ahead. What are, what's your best shot as the rules of professional responsibility? I'm not a lawyer, 
You're not a lawyer. Okay. It's a lawyer in the room. Go ahead. Bye. The ABA model rules of professional responsibility are models that are generally adopted by various states in order to regulate uh, professional conduct with an overarching goal of protecting the integrity of the profession. Give this guy a round of applause. That's better than I would have ever done if I wrote it down and was reading it. So, um, But the, the interesting thing about this is that these, these model rules don't cover any of us. These are model rules that are then adopted by your state, and then they become law. I mean, so they're, they're actual statutes wherever you're practicing. Um, is a really fine point. The states are free to, to tweak them a bit, and lots of states tweak them a bit. Um, so if you find yourself really in trouble or really trying to answer one of these questions, you don't go to the model rules. You go to your state laws, that, and they're probably the same, but they may not be the same, and there may be nuances. And the people who study this stuff and make this a practice of law, they know all of those nuances. We don't need to worry about those nuances here. We want the big picture stuff. All right, so this time we're talking about, oh, interesting. So this is we're talking about turtles and just a side fun thing. So I, I paint animals. And so I've got a painting of one of these turtles for everybody. When you're done, come up and you can get a turtle. Um, and so I've learned that we need visual stimulation. We are so oriented to this fast clip thing. If you think of your television, you know, it's, it doesn't go more than five seconds before the scene changes. So you're going to see rotating turtles because we're talking about uh, a person tur helping turtles. So with that, we're going to start. So Billy Miller is always the uh, lawyer that I use. So if you've been here before, you'll know the trouble she's been in, in the past. Billy Miller is an attorney who loves the sea. In fact, her practice concentrate, concentrates on the Siemens Act. I had a Siemens Act case once, so I thought that'd be kind of fun. She was raised in the coastal, coastal town of Turtle Bay and continues to live and work in Turtle Bay. The main draw to the town is, is the Turtle Bay itself, the bay. Not surprisingly, the bay is inhabited by turtles. <laughs> Billy loves sea animals, including sea turtles. There is a new animal welfare group being formed to help protect the local sea turtles. Local guide companies take tourists out to where the turtles live and allow the turtles or the, the uh, tourists to swim with the turtles. Turtle advocates believe this is harassing the turtles and wants the practice stopped. Billy attended the first meeting of the Society of Turtles. Carl Simon, the founder and executive director of the group, started a discussion about banning all watercraft, so all watercraft, from Turtle Bay. This would include canoes, kayaks, motor boats, fishing boats, charter boats, basically anything that floats. A lot of people liked the idea, but wondered if an ordinance like this would be legal. You know, is that legal? Can we even do that? Carl, this is the uh, executive director of the newly formed group, saw Billy in the audience and said, hey, Billy, you're a lawyer, right? Will this kind of law hold up? I mean, that's kind of how we get pitched real questions in the real world. Billy answered, sure, the bay is part of the town, and the town can do whatever they want. Actually, Billy had no clue about whether such a law would run afoul of existing federal or state laws regarding maritime, maritime activities, land use, environmental laws, or the Endangered Species Act. So here's her motivation. Billy just wanted to look smart in front of the group that included several of the cool kids that called her a nerd in high school. So she's been in this town her whole life. So uh, we're going to break and have a discussion. Now, um, if you've seen one of these before, I, I, on purpose, I have not packed this section with a lot of issues, but there is a one really important issue in here. And so break for a bit, talk amongst yourselves. What has Billy either done wrong, or what kind of situation has she found herself in by popping off with this answer in this, in this public setting, you know, giving this opinion that um, obviously she has not researched. So get into some groups somehow. So you folks over there, I know you're going to have to scoot over. Um, three, four, five people and talk about it amongst yourselves. And I will come back and then we will talk about what, this section, which is really has, is packed with really one of the most important concepts of the whole lecture. All right. Let's, let's circle back. And uh, figure out where Billy is. So, what's one of the what's one of the issues that you see? Just identify the issue. 
No issues. Competency. Competency. All right. Competency. So there's a rule about competency, um, but I'm not going to read it. We're just going to talk about it. Um, so obviously, I put this thing about she, she's being this maritime lawyer or Siemens Act lawyer, and she's here giving this advice. Is there anything inherently wrong with giving advice on something that's outside of your practice area? No. No. Yeah. Why not? Yes. I mean, there's, yeah. I'm not going to beat up anybody. You know, what, why not? <laughs> go ahead. Well, I don't, I don't, I came late and I apologize. That's fine. No, go ahead. The weather was really bad, so I only yeah. heard half the story. Got it. But I would, I would think that if, in fact, she gave, if she had given an admonishment of information instead of advice, that would have helped her a great deal. Uh, but she can backtrack yeah. and say, you know, I was wrong. You know, what's wrong with that? I mean, really, quite frankly, they're, they're losing the issue if mm -hmm. they take her to task because she gave them bad information. Yeah. They're missing the issue. The issue is how do we save the turtles and also accommodate the voters? Right. Because you can't go one over the other. They, they really live together. Right. They do live together. So if um, so, can a, can a Siemens Act lawyer uh, take on a divorce? Yes. Yeah. Oh. Sure. 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 And never have, a, never have a divorce class in law school. Yeah. I mean, think of the, uh, particularly when you get hair of my color, you think of the crazy stuff you've done over your career, and you got a client, and you want to help them. And what do we do then? You cram. You cram. That's exactly right. We had a discussion last night where, you know, uh, I remember going into a law school, you know, learning ab about something when I was out of town because I needed that information right then, and I didn't, and I was better than I didn't have a clue, but, you know, I needed, I needed to bone up on it. So, of course, lawyers are allowed to go in and learn material for a new area of law, in fact, you can take your career in a whole new area and something you never studied in law school. And, and the, the model rule talks about competency and it talks about, you've got to be competent and it talks about the ways you get there. So the ways you get there are through experience or through, or through study and it can be independent study. I mean, you can just learn the material. You can go to, to educational classes. You can read the case law. You can do whatever. So there's nothing inherently wrong with her saying uh, or being able to advise a client um, on these topics, even though she's the Siemens Act lawyer, which I get great pleasure out of having her be a Siemens Act lawyer. All right, now um, I mentioned the word client. Yeah. So what's that issue? Is that, are they her client? Yeah, are they her client? In fact, and that's that's one of the biggest things, and that's why I isolated this for this section and, and didn't pack it for lots of issues, because we're often in this situation. Are we the lawyer for these nonprofits that we're volunteering for? Are we? So I'll ask a couple questions. Does it matter if we get paid or not? No, I mean, that doesn't matter at all. We can do pro bono work. I mean, that's, that's not even a factor when you're looking at these kinds of cases. Or in particular, to scare you, lawyers who have been sued for being somebody's lawyer when they didn't think they were their other lawyer. Um, does it matter um, what the lawyer thinks? The lawyer thinks, no, I'm just a volunteer out there. You know, I'm just trying to help. No. Does the lawyer's perspective care at all? No, it's who? It's the, client's it's the client's perspective. It's the client's perspective. So, you know, does the client think that this person is their lawyer? And here's the rub. You can never really tell, right? I mean, does this, this guy, he's asking an opinion. Is he just asking for an opinion off the cuff? And, well, we got, we'll get a little bit of information here, but we can really check it out later. Or does he really think, wow, it's great. We got a lawyer here. I'll tell you where this really comes to play. It's something you really need to be careful of. Um, a lot of times, as lawyers who volunteer for nonprofits, are asked to be on boards. They want us on the board of directors. Now, those people on the board, they want you there because you're a lawyer. You know, they probably don't want you on there because of your animal handling experience. You know, so you're being put on there with the expectation that you're going to help them out with legal problems. I mean, almost from the get-go, it's a reasonable assumption that they think that, that you're representing them, which is a problem. Unless you want to represent them. And then you have to get off the board. Yeah, and then, 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 then the smart move is to get off the board, attend the board meetings, but not be a voting board member, because now you can really segment where your responsibilities lie, you know, in terms of the responsibility to the board members, responsibility to the organization, you know, inclusion of the, um, of the management if they get a... Uh, executive director that's you know not the head of the board so you know these things all play in but they all trigger on whether you've got an attorney-client relationship 
So now let me scare you. So yeah, go ahead. Jump in there. Yeah. Um, I think it really. Uh, I sit on the board um, of the Vancouver Humane Society in, in British yeah. Columbia, and uh, and it's very clear. For one, the organization has outside counsel right. pro bono, so it's very clear that I'm not their lawyer. And actually, quite frankly, half our board um, is comprised of lawyers. Sure. And and we give off the cuff uh, opinions. I say that loosely uh, all the time. And it's very clear, we don't say, every time I open my mouth, mm -hmm. I don't say, I'm not here as your lawyer. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there's a bit of common sense as well, and I guess it really depends on the situation. Right, and it and does. And the organization, it, the size of it. And all of this is situational based, and in those kinds of situations where there's a clear outside counsel, and you know, every once in a while you remind everybody that you're not their lawyer, I mean, that's exactly the best practice. But that's not what I see a lot. I mean, I see lots of the other thing. Yes. I'll, I'll throw one more wrinkle in. I'm admitted in Pennsylvania, but I sit on a board and live in New Jersey. There you go. Uh, but, but and do you have a license there? Yeah. And I do not have a license in the, New Jersey, so yes. I don't have that squire anything on my cards. Yeah. <laughs> so let me throw out one scary thing before you move on. So uh, to get ready for these things, I have pulled case law and read people who've really gotten clobbered under these laws. And I read a case that said, all it takes to become somebody's lawyer is somebody ask you a legal question and you give them a legal answer. And I just Probably heard, oh, cocktail you know. party. the cocktail party problem. Uh, who, here is, is, who here has seen a lawyer? I won't ask if it's you and I won't ask you to raise your hands. Has seen a lawyer answer a question at a cocktail party after they've had more than two drinks, okay? And according to this one case, Guess what? You should have run a conflicts check first. You know, you should have had a client intake. You should have done all of those things you do because you represent them. Or I didn't say you. The person you just saw do this represents them. So be very, very careful in terms of the creation of this attorney-client relationship. The best practice is to tell folks, I don't represent you. I'm just going to make a comment here or in general. But make it clear, I don't represent you. And that will be a lot better than if you don't say that. All right, we're going to move on. So that's such an important point, I kind of isolated it. Now we're going to have a lot more topics. The following week, Billy called Carl Simon, the founder of the Society of the Turtles. Billy asked if Carl wanted her to draft a proposed city ordinance that would ban watercraft from Turtle Bay. He said, sure. Billy had never drafted a municipal ordinance in the past. Um, and then he says, you can do that as long as it doesn't cost us anything. And she fired back. Well, that's no problem, as long as you never sue me. <laughs> then, Billy told, uh, Billy, yeah. then Billy told Carl that he had known the city attorney since high school and would be glad to pitch the idea to the new ordinance to her old high school friend. Billy took the ordinance she drafted, so she drafted an ordinance, to the city attorney, who was Sally Smith. She wanted to ask Sally her opinion of the ordinance. Billy had not reviewed the ordinance she drafted with any from, anyone from the Society of Eternals. She drafted it and then just ran with it. The city attorney, Sally Smith, hated the ordinance. Come on, Billy, you know a lot of people depend on tourism in this town, and banning boats from the bay will be catastrophic to the local economy. There's no way in hell I'm going to support this, and there's no way the council will ever approve it either. Billy responded, listen, Sally, if you don't get behind helping the turtles, I'm going to tell everyone that your mom kills turtles to make turtle soup. Now, Sally's mother had made turtle soup for Billy and Sally when they were a little kid, but that was decades ago. Later that night, Billy attended the local Chamber of Commerce meeting where turtles and the economy was the topic. The group was furious about the total ban on watercraft as it was proposed. It would ban fishing boats, pleasure craft, sightseeing boats, fishing charters, as well as swimming with the turtle adventure tours. The chamber members generally did like the idea of banning swimming with the turtles, though. Billy spoke up at the Chamber of Commerce meeting and said, not banning all boats is a good approach. I've spoken to the city attorney, and it's clear that the city would never pass a complete boat ban. If the chamber would like, I could draft an ordinance that would just ban swimming with the turtles. I know the city attorney and could present the ordinance on behalf of the Chamber of Commerce. The head of the Chamber of Commerce said, go for it. <coughs> Billy went back to Carl Simon, the founder of the uh, Turtle Society let him know that she had drafted the first ordinance banning all watercraft from the bay, and it does not look like the city would ever pass the ordinance. She also told him that she drafted an ordinance that might be passed, one that only banned swimming with the turtles but allowed other watercraft in the bay. 
She tried to convince Carl that an incremental approach to advancing animal protection was better than taking a, some type of abolitionist approach. Carl was furious. We want a complete ban of watercraft in the bay. It's the only way to truly protect the turtles from being harassed by the humans. You're no friend of the turtles, and you're done with helping us. All right, now with that, talk amongst ourselves and see if she might be in trouble in a few more areas. So for those who joined, we're, we're gathering into small clumps and discussing uh, possible violations of uh, ethical rules. <laughs> Okay. Anybody see anything wrong with uh, the way Billy's conducting yourself? Somebody throw out one thing. Billy should not have. Go ahead. Mom's turtle soup. Mom's turtle soup. No, mom's turtle soup. So this was an. Um, Something we, I just added last time. Um, so what's wrong with mom's turtle soup? We inherently know it, it's bad. There's actually, I'll, I'll just, I'll just tell you. There's a, there's, there's a rule out there that says that you can't go out and embarrass and harass third parties. I mean, it's just flat rule that says you can't do that. And so this, this harassment of, of third parties, you know, is something we can't do as lawyers. So. So, and this can be, become important for the work we do when you think about putting pressure on somebody to do something that you want them to do because you're representing animals. If that's pressure on a third party, you need, you need to pull these rules out and read it. So, so that's improper. You, you, can't, um, you can't do that. Um, what else? Very good pickup. And that's a new one. I like it. Yeah. Somebody talk about the two groups. Conflicts. There is a big conflict of interest. And the reason I bring this up is because if, if I was talking to a group that w wasn't in this room, non-animal people, people <laughs> who don't spend a lot of time um, helping nonprofits that help animals, you often think that, boy, you know, HSUS and PETA, I mean, they got to be working together on everything, right? Um, and of course, they don't. And I, and I will tell you, even organizations, and if you read their mission statement, and, and you knew it would look like they're the same group, but they can, be, they can hate each other. Anybody ever seen that? Where one nonprofit um, working in the animal welfare, animal rights field, um, is working on the same project as another nonprofit in the same field, and they disagree. Raise your hand. Yeah, it, it's almost the rule. I mean, it can be a subtle difference, but that subtle difference can mean everything to those of us, I'll throw myself in there too, those of us who are, who are passionate about this work. And so I call this the problem of the shifting client. Now, I've never read that anywhere, but I tell you, I see this all of the time. There's a project. We're trying to, to help this elephant in the zoo. We're trying to help the turtles. We're trying to do whatever. There's four groups that are kind of tangentially involved. We're kind of working together. We're kind of not working together. But if you're a lawyer, what has a tendency to do is you work with whoever seems to be doing the most, you know, the forefront runner. But then they fall aside because of whatever reason. And then some other group looks like they're getting more traction with a little different approach. And you jump ship and you start working with that group. Remember, it doesn't take much to form an attorney-client relationship. And if you form that relationship, you go to the second group. Okay, now you've got two different clients. You've got a, at least a potential conflict. You almost always have a conflict, too. You've got a potential conflict. So what can you do in those situations? Got to get a waiver from both clients. Got to get a waiver from both clients. Good luck with that. Yeah. Yeah, because that brings up the whole discussion, and now you're the bad person that's, you know, that's bringing it all to the, to the forefront. So how do we avoid that? So this is like the best practices thing. How do we get to do the work we really want to do, which is to help whoever's pushing the thing along the best? This is why you came for this presentation. This will be really helpful. How can you help both groups? Go ahead. By having them focus on what's important to the animal, as opposed to what's important to their own individual agenda. Yeah, but I think that's tough. 
I'll just flat say it and just say, oh, say yeah. I think that trying to get the organizations together so that they'll work Focus together. On the animal, right? As yeah. opposed to what their own agenda and their ego says. It's yeah. really hard. Yeah, I know. What's an easier approach for you, a lawyer? Yeah. Either stick with one client or disclose the potential conflicts to all of them and get their written consent. So you, yeah, you got to get the written consent if you're going to do it. What happens if you figure there's no way in hell these people are ever going to agree on anything and you're never going to get their consent? How do you get to help both groups? See, it's not obvious. Get another attorney involved. Yeah, I'm just going to say it. Don't represent either one of them. The smart money is just don't represent them. So now you can go to five groups. You can do your own thing. You can work independently. But to do that, you have to make it clear when you're sitting in these meetings that you don't represent them. And the easiest way not to represent them is to never give legal advice. Go ahead. Can you represent one, like maybe the one that you started sure. with, and also put, as long as you make it clear that you're not representing the other five? Sure, so you can do that, that and, and that happens all of the time. Okay. But the problem with the case of the shifting client is you don't want to represent the first one after a while because they're, they get tired of it and they say, forget it, we're not working on this anymore. But another group really pushes the, the matter forward, the freeing of the elephant, the doing of the whatever, the passing of the ordinance. And I, and I see this in the real world all of the time where different organizations, you know, they're, they're moving around the issue and then different ones take off at different times. So, so the best practice, I'll just throw it out, the best practice is to make it just really clear that you don't represent anybody. You are nobody's lawyer here. You are a activist volunteer that happens to have a law license in that state or not in that state or just happen to go to law school. And then be careful about giving advice. You know, if they can use you in a lot, a lot of other ways and this will always keep you out of trouble. I, I, uh got some coffee, so I might have missed this part. Okay. Um, it, was there a problem besides the creation of the conflict with the attorney being in this meeting and saying, hey, no problem, I'll, I'll do that for you, in the sense that it seems like you're soliciting, you're, you know, yeah. you're saying, I'm, you know, I'm going to be your lawyer, and I thought that violated some rules. Yeah, so uh, guess what? That's in there for a purpose, and it's like that exact purpose. Yeah. So can you go to the nonprofit who, you know, you're not general counsel for, you know, you don't have an ongoing relationship and say, hey, let me do that for you. Let me write that ordinance. Isn't that the old ambulance chasing rule? Yeah, yeah. That's exactly it. Does it matter that you're not getting paid? No, no. it doesn't. Go ahead. Oh, no, I'm sorry. You're, you're in. Good. Yeah, so um, you got to be careful about volunteering to do stuff because you're not allowed to volunteer to do stuff for people who aren't your clients. Doesn't seem intuitive, does it? It seems like I would be able to give them away my time. But you're soliciting a client. And you can't do that. You can't do that. Now, if you've got a long-standing, uh, you know, relationship with them, there's some other rules, like, you know, possibly, you know, with the with the Chamber of Commerce thing, if she'd been a member for 10 years, I mean, there's maybe some ways around it. But just remember, you just can't be in a room full of people who need your services and say, um, hire me, whether hire me involves money or not. What else we got in here? There's, this one was packed. Yeah. Do you have a, no, something else you did wrong. Go ahead. Well, I think you can't, if you're entering an agreement to have a client, you can't say, and you can't sue me. I mean, if that's really a, we're going to call that. Sure. That you can't, you can't tell a client. Yeah, I'll represent you, but remember, you know, you can't sue me. I mean, yeah, there's a rule. It's 1.8. It just says you cannot restrict um, suits against malpractice. It's just, it just flat prohibited. So, um, I mean, I don't, I don't see this that often, but I have seen it. I'll be glad to help you, but just know, you know, I'm just, I'm just kind of doing this, and you know, don't sue me if I kind of get it wrong. I'll do the best I can here, but you know, you, that, that just violates the rules. If they're a client. You owe them competence, period. You know, whether you're getting paid or not, no matter how much time you decide you're going to put in, you have to be a competent lawyer for them. And you cannot restrict uh, your liability for malpractice. Good catch. Good catch. <laughs> that, was, that was a new thing that just got added this time. So. What else do we see? I think she should raise her hand because I think she saw something. Oh, you got something? Oh, me? Yeah. yeah, you. Yeah. We, we talked about just 
how knowledgeable she was about the actual drafting, if it was something that she didn't have a lot of experience with. So we were wondering how she prepared and if mm -hmm. that was adequate. And I don't think I heard that she had anyone look at it. Yeah, so. she didn't. All right, so there's two issues there. One was she didn't circle back around for the first client and let them look at the draft ordinance before she went up. Now, th there's a nuance here. You're allowed to do that if the client tells you, draft it and run with it. You know, you can get permission from a client to launch an entire huge section of work without circling back, but they have to agree to it. But in a case like this where she's drafting it, um, it certainly would have been wise to circle back around, if not required, so that the client knew what was in there. Because whose responsibility is it for the, for the overall direction of the representation? Is that the client or the lawyer? <coughs> it's the client, always the client. And so the client needs to know what's going on. So at least, if not reading a discussion, here's what I put in, this is what it covers, there, 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 should, have been, there should have been the circle back. In terms of competence, going back to Rule 1.1, Sure, she could get up to speed on that. It would take some work. Any of the folks in this room who have drafted ordinances know it's, it's harder than it looks. And she could do it. And of course, you do that by reading up on it, by looking at other ordinances in that same jurisdiction. I mean, it could be done, and it is done. But it does take, it does take some skill and some, some preparation. Uh, that's, that's the big one. Um, we're going to go into the next segment. Billy was upset about the conflict between the Chamber of Commerce and the Society of Turtles. At 3 o'clock in the morning, we, we hear that a lot these days, at 3 o'clock in the morning she <laughs> tweeted, I'm sick and tired of everybody talking about helping the turtle while nobody actually is helping the turtles. Then she never presented the Chamber of Commerce ordinance she drafted to the city. So that's the second one. She just quit. Every year the Chamber of Commerce, now we're going into a whole different mindset. Every year the Chamber of Commerce holds turtle days at the beach. It's a combination of uh, celebration of the turtles. It has a concert. There's a turtle-themed art fair right there, um, and a beer festival. The Chamber of Commerce organizers ran out of ice. Billy has a vintage land cruiser, so they asked Billy to run out and get 20 bags of ice. Mike Osborne, a retired Navy SEAL, and the current treasurer, that's important, current treasurer of the Chamber of Commerce, get Billy $100 in cash to pay for the ice. She picked up the ice and threw in a bag of Santitas tortilla chips. They're vegan. I looked them up. Um, she pays the ice house, ice house with her debit card. While waiting for the concert to start, there was a lively and somewhat drunken discussion between the Chamber of Commerce members as the best way to sink a boat if anybody did use one to take the tourists out to swim with the turtles. Mike, the retired Navy SEAL, said he'd blow out many a vessel back in the day, and he says the trick is to blow a hole in the boat and let the boat just sink itself. Billy commented to no one in particular, be careful out there. Remember, there's a security camera on the marina roof that catches everything. That night, and I did this because I know my audience here, that night, the band Three Dog Night was brought in for the concert. <laughs> Billy set up her lawn chair to listen to the concert and watch the sunset. Mike, the retired Navy SEAL, pulled up a chair next to Billy. They were drinking beer crafted by the Turtle Anarchy Brewing Company, and that's real, by the way, um, as they listened to Mama Told Me Not to Come and What is the Loneliest Number. Things went well between them. By the end of the night, Mike and Billy had walked down the beach to a secluded cove and did what they called the beach turtle dance. And if there's any millennials in the room, they would have simply called that a hookup. I was looking for a fun way to talk about sex, so that's sex. All right, see if there's any issues that you see. So what's at least one thing that she should be concerned about? I'm sorry? Conspiracy. Go ahead. You can, yeah, I think, well, it's possible, it seems, that you have to do something more formal to withdraw as in representing a client. You can't just say, screw that, I'm not going to do that. Yeah, I mean, you got to withdraw. Um, the, the, the other piece of that is that you have to have, uh, you have to use diligence in, in working with the client. So just not working on it for a while because you don't feel like it just isn't it. Um, and if you're going to withdraw, there, there are certainly ways to withdraw because, you know, the client probably doesn't think that you've withdrawn just because you sent out that. So I left it ambiguous for a reason, um, but clearly you've got you to withdraw. The client needs to know that you're no longer their lawyer or you continue to be their lawyer and that's not a position you want to be in. Um, and then the diligence piece. I mean, I see this a lot where somebody volunteers to do something, they kind of lose interest and then they just 
don't show up, they don't do anything, but yet they're still their lawyer and you've committed to do something and you haven't done it, you violated you know, the, the, the rule on diligence. Um, what else? How about the money? Let's just, I'll just, because we're, we're getting close to time, so I'll just direct us into it. What about the money? She took it, and what did she do with it? She didn't return it. She didn't return it. And she misspent it. Okay. Or passed part of it. So we've got to do, what's our duty with the money? Segregate the funds. Yeah, your, your duty is to segregate it, keep it separate, and do what else with it? Trust fund, protect it. You, trust funds do that. Yeah, so she's got a duty to segregate the money, not commingle. Commingle is the term. If you look at the people whose bar licenses are suspended, you know, it co commingles are almost always in that paragraph. So, <laughs> even if you don't miss music, commingling it. So, the minute it hit her purse or wallet and it went in with whatever other $4, we got, we got commingling going on. And, and, it's, and that's a problem. Let me give you a best practice on this, because this is a situation um, I've seen many, many times. And it's not negative, it just happens. You're in a position of trust when you're somebody's lawyer. They trust you to do things that they don't trust other people to do. And it's pretty common for somebody, a nonprofit, to send you out to do something because you just happen to be there. And you're volunteering. It's not like they're paying you your hourly rate to go get ice. And so they ask you to go get ice. The, the best practice is to never take their money, never. Instead, pay for it, and then submit a receipt and have somebody pay you back. Now you're not commingling any funds. You haven't had to safeguard their funds because you've never had their funds. And you don't run a pro, and I've looked into this in detail, there's that, that rule back there that says that you can't advance funds for your client. That's dealing with litigation and advancing living costs and other things. So this really doesn't you know, fall into that realm. And so she spends $80 or $120 or $122 and 80, you know, two cents, keep the receipt, submit it, get paid, you're clean. So that's just the best practice that I've seen if you find yourself in that situation so that you don't have this $100 thing be, you know, a commingling of funds of your client, which just sounds horrible when you read it in the back of the bar journal. Um, what else? What else we got going here? Well, and the money with the chips, just to say, like, she, he said, here's money for the ice, and then she took it upon herself to get chips. Right, and I left it ambiguous as to how much she spent. But she, did she pay for it with, with his money? No. no. She paid for it with her personal Better. debit card. Mm -hmm. I um, made this tricky. Yeah. Because this is the way the real world would work. I mean, you got hundred bucks, you throw it in your, in your wallet, you throw it in your purse, you're paying... I do every, almost everything with debit card these days. I mean, that's how it might really play out. And, it's, and, and if you do a law school analysis, I mean, she tripped up the second she put it in her wallet, because then she commingled. Had she put it in an envelope that had the client's name on it, put it in a separate part of her purse, we don't have commingling now. If she would have paid with that cash and put the change back in the envelope with the receipt, we would have been fine. But what's the likelihood somebody in the real world is going to go through all of that? Zero. It's about zero, and so use my best practice. Just don't take their money. I represent a church, one of these big mega churches, and the pastor there has a rule. He doesn't carry any cash, and he doesn't handle any client or any parishioner's money of any kind. Somebody gives him a donation. He says that there's a lockbox at the front of the church for that. Refuses to touch the money. He's never been in trouble, but he says that's his way to avoid it. So watch the money. What else we got? The tweet. So you got the the middle of the night tweet, which is you know two things never do: never write your client at three in the morning, and never write client after the second glass of Merlot, right? Um, so yeah, the, the tweet is kind of an attempt to withdraw. It's not clear if they're withdrawing. It's also public. You know, this isn't a conversation between your client. You shouldn't be withdrawing from your client on on, on Twitter. You know, this should, there should be a more private way to do this. Yeah, the treat's bad in probably three or four different ways. Disparage the clients. Yeah, disparaging the clients, saying, you know, she's done with them all. Yeah, not good. So there's a lot of bad things about the tweet. Again, she's acting as if she's a volunteer. She's not acting as if she's her lawyer. Um, what, uh, what about the blow up the boat thing? <laughs> I have seen conversations where people get drunk and talk about such things, you know? 
it's not outside of the realm of what you might experience out there. So what, what can she do? What should she do? What about her comment? Just don't get caught. You know, there's a camera up there. Um, you're not supposed to either be a betting, knowing, or whatever that a client could do actual I mean, real harm. Crime. Well, there's two aspects. Yeah, there's there's crime period, and there's a whole other category for, for bodily harm. Um, and there's a whole other category for things that are going to cost your client a lot of money. Um, so, yeah, you should... So, so let me give you the real-world practical piece. Of the, obviously, you can't do this. You can't give any advice that would help somebody commit a crime or a client commit a crime. Um, and whether she's done that or not, by saying that I get caught, I think we're, we're close enough that it would bother me. Go ahead. Sorry, I mean, maybe it's a fine distinction, but my appreciation is that you can't advise a client to commit a crime. It's a little different from giving them information that could help them commit a crime. It is. All right, so there, there's a nuance there, but it's not, I'll put it this way, it, it's not a nuance I'd want to argue if my name was on the top of that bar complaint. Yes. You know, just avoid it. So let me give you a best practice on this uh, because you might see this. Somebody starts talking about, you know, any kind of criminal acts. Um, um, you just flat say, you know, you guys shouldn't do anything criminal. And without saying another word, you know, pick up your purse and leave. With the client's money. Yeah, with the client's <laughs> money. Just get out of there. There is nothing else in that conversation you want to hear or be a part of other than you advise them not to do anything and you left. Now, if you really find yourself in this situation and somebody does commit a crime, I mean, the first thing you need to do is, is to read the rules. Second thing is to hire yourself a lawyer that deals in this stuff. Um, there are there's some, some responsibilities, and it, this is really, really complicated about when you're allowed to um, uh, disclose when a client, when you know a client is going to or has done something. Um, and most of us won't find ourselves in there, but if you find yourself there, don't rely on anything you're hearing in a CLE. You know, hire yourself a lawyer because it's it's going to get it's it's very complicated. About not only if you've got an oblig sometimes you got an obligation, sometimes you don't have an obligation. Sometimes it's a you can if you want to. Sometimes you have to notify the board of the of the nonprofit. There's lots of stuff that you should just know is there. Go ahead. Um. So. What about this situation? It seems like she is also amongst this group of, and I, know, I, I realize this is where a lot of the, like, the problem comes from, but she's amongst this group of friends, mm -hmm. this very social event, and like maybe I just have really sarcastic friends, yeah. but like everybody says things like that at some point in time and they're dealing with this situation where, I, I know. you know, you're feeling, so I mean, do you really think that that would rise to the level of something? What it this way? What happens if the next day a boat was blown up and sunk? Right, but I mean, I feel like you would probably like, right. But I mean, that's like in this in this instance, she is friends with these people. So is this just a is this something that's just? I would I would I would give you my perspective. I'll give you my perspective. If if it's a situation and there and it's clearly a group of clients that are in there. I think the best practice is to say, don't, don't blow anything up, don't violate the law, and leave. Yeah. And I will, I will say that because what I have seen is groups of passionate folks, um, and granted, they're just blowing off steam and they would never do anything, but they sit there and they plot how, what they would do, yeah. how they're going to free the animals, how they're going to break in and free the, the minks or the chicken, or, or how they're going to you know, do whatever you know, at, the, at the factory farm. Um, and those discussions can go for a while because folks like to talk about that when they're drinking. So I think if it's, if it's a client-based thing, best practice is not to rely on your instincts there but to leave. Because all it takes is then somebody going out and doing one of these criminal acts, and now you've sat in a planning session for it. You don't get out of that. That's just bad. So go against your instinct. My advice, go against your instinct and leave. Just leave. If you're, if you're the lawyer. If you're the lawyer. Right. Of course, yeah, if you're the lawyer. Right. Yeah. All right, what else? We got one big one. Sex with the client. Sex with the client. And that's <laughs> what, what we're going to end on here. So, um, <laughs> the, and, and, I, and I, I, I love telling the story. So I was doing the same kind of presentation with a group of law students. And what the, what the real rule is, because we're out of time, I'm just going to tell you, is you can have sex with a client, but you have to have been having sex with a client before they became a client. 
So maybe it's a nuance, but that's what that's what the rule says. And I mean, and that helps you so that if you get a you know girlfriend or a boyfriend or a wife or a spouse or whatever, and then you want to go fix their you know work on their parking ticket, you know you're not violating you know the rules. I mean, it's a it's a common sense kind of thing. So I had this one student say, well, "All right, so here's the deal. So as soon as you go and you start working for a new nonprofit, the first thing is you look for all the hot people that you might want to have sex with. You have sex with them before you ever represent them, and then you're covered at least for the next year." And she was serious. So. Um, I wouldn't advise that approach, but, but I think it's humorous enough. But it gets it gets the point across. Here's a tell story. It gets the point across. It's not sex with clients. It's sex with clients um, who uh, you hadn't had sex with before they became a client. Okay. With that, I'm going to read the conclusion in the in the last minute. Um, no new ordinances were passed to help the turtles, but the Society of Turtles started a public education program that made it unthinkable to even think about swimming with the turtles. The charter boat businesses worked with the Chamber of Commerce and created an artificial snorkeling reef that included a sunken ship salted with fake doubloons. In between cases, Billy travels to beach communities with Mike Osborne, remember this seal guy, where they gather sea turtle nesting data and the turtles are, sur are thriving. So that's our presentation. Hopefully we got some points across that keep you out of trouble. And come and grab a, a painting of a turtle that I, these are not prints, they're originals, so come and grab one. I painted one for each of you. Thank you, and wasn't that the best CLE for yes. ethics you've ever had?